Amen. Well, as I said, we were going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 11. If you guys are turning there, we will put it on the screen when we read through it, but some may want to refer back to it as we move along. And we hope the Lord's Word has endured for thousands of years, amen? It's accrued. We've actually got 66 books in our Bible, but of course, right around the end of the first century was when the last book, likely the Revelation of John, was written down, and we had what we call the full canon of Scripture, and that's been around then for 2,000 years. So we have the blessing and benefit of of thousands of years of an enduring word, an enduring story, and a true story, longer than any of us have been alive. Am I right? Just checking. If we have any Highlanders here, uh, but I I was discovering something that was older than I this week is also still around today. I was kind of surprised. Who 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 can tell me who this is? I, I was going to say, I did, there's an arrow, I mean, okay, I heard Scooby-Doo, so everybody got the central one right there, but let's do a test of those who have been aware of this, who, who do we have here? Shaggy, Velma, wow, that was a lot of voices, this is, this is, this is a cartoon that has been around since 1969. This dog is looking pretty good for 53 years, and that's not dog years. In fact, we've we've now tallied up, I looked it up, 14 series over, that's 29 seasons, over 400 episodes, and on top of that, 45 films and other television specials. The latest one, the latest one is actually on HBO, it's it's Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, and every week has a celebrity like Weird Al Yankovic or Neil deGrasse Tyson, very strange, and they help them. Now, even so, it still follows the classic formula. Many of you probably know this classic formula. We have some mystery-solving teens, as evidenced by the mystery machine that they drive around in. They investigate haunted castles, haunted abandoned gold mines, haunted department stores, you get the idea. Just put haunted in front of anything. And they'll look at the clues. They will usually use the dog and his uh, befuddled friend Shaggy for bait. And they will catch that ghost. They will trap it with some kind of mousetrap kind of way of getting it in a net or in a cage. But unlike the Ghostbusters, they pull that mask off the ghost, right? Then they they, they say, let's see who's really behind this. And the reality then in the Scooby-Doo universe is there is no ghost. Nothing supernatural, nothing beyond the material world. It's all human invention or human deception. Usually there's a, a, literally here we have a mustache-twisting villain using, they're, they're using a superstition or old myths and folklore to manipulate people for their own purposes or ambitions, usually to scare people away from a treasure. And on one hand, there's nothing wrong with this story. It teaches kids to look for clues, to examine mysteries, to be curious, to not necessarily take everything at face value. It's, it's like a bit of Arthur Conan Doyle-style deduction with a dog. But I, I later have come to realize that that repetition in a child's mind can reinforce an idea with potential trouble for the Christian. By pulling the mask off every spook, every specter, the, the unspoken inference, in fact, I take it back, sometimes it's the spoken reality in the show, is that there's nothing beyond the grave, there's nothing that can't be explained rationally, I'll even put that in quotes, that, that all mysteries can be solved by human ingenuity. Ultimately, there's, there's just nothing but the material world. In fact, they have a mystery machine. Every mystery can be solved by this human construct, this system that they have. And now some fans I know, there's some people sitting out there right now like, James, no, no, there have been a few episodes where it's been a real ghost. Okay, there's, there's, there's always an exception to the rule. In fact, I checked this out also. One episode, they even had a real ghost appear in the story called the Funky Phantom because the 70s. And, but Velma curiously refused to believe it no matter what. So the show clearly presented this was a real ghost, a real encounter with otherworldly, something beyond the material world, And she always finds a way to explain it away in the episode, even without evidence. She just will not accept it. 
That's the attitude toward anything beyond the material world. And it's an attitude of doubt. It's an attitude of skepticism. And it's an attitude of disbelief. Now, there are plenty of myths worth debunking. Right? The, the phantom coal miner, certainly that we can debunk that. But this can tend toward a dismissive attitude, I think, toward larger issues of spirit and transcendent realities. In fact, most times, Scooby and Shaggy are shown to be very foolish for believing and fearing anything beyond the material universe. And of course, in these stories, the, those otherworldly things are silly. So the, that idea is reinforced. It's all silly. Nothing supernatural. Nothing beyond the material world. Everything believed that's beyond this world is either human invention or deception or using old superstitions or myth or folklore or even prophecies to manipulate people for human purposes and ambitions. I was curious, so doubt and disbelief are, are two powerful tools. It be used externally, and it could also just manifest in our own hearts. But we see it bubble up in some people here in the context of Matthew chapter 11. And so we're going to investigate a little bit of Scooby-Doo-style mystery and unmask some of the Scripture today as we go. We've been moving through the book of Matthew. We've looked at his Jesus lineage. We've looked at his upbringing. We've then looked at his teaching. We've seen a whole bunch of miracles over a couple of chapters, and then we've seen him last week commission the disciples to go out and speak and act on his authority. And so now we're actually going to see a character come back into the narrative from earlier chapters, and we catch up with where he's at in heart and mind, and, and actually even in location, because he's in prison. So I'll pray, and we'll read chapter 11. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Help us to sift your mysteries. Help us to understand well, Lord, as we do seek to, to get to the truth, help us also understand that, that the world will sometimes push us in the wrong directions. Instead of finding the truth, they'll push us toward doubt or disbelief. Uh, we have that capacity within our own hearts enough. We don't need it from the external to help us to trust and rely on your word this morning. Help, have may your Holy Spirit speak to us through the reading and then the mindfulness we give by your grace to your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So it begins, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. As these men were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone who has ears listen. To what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to, each, who call out to other children. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but he didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Then he proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. 
But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted into heaven? No. You will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. But I tell you, it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was for your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal Him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. As we, as we dig in here, one of the first things we see is, is John is in prison. King Herod had tossed him into confinement because John, he's a truth teller, he's bold. He's like, Herod, you're in a sinful relationship with your, you took your brother's wife. John tells it like it is. He's fearless, right? We, we encountered him earlier in Matthew. He's the rough and tumble guy. His clothes are made of what? Camel hair, kind of has a buggy diet. And he keeps, and he's just saying, repent, the kingdom is near. Repent. He's the guy who baptized Jesus. Do you, some of you would remember that. You go back and read about that. Jesus comes from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized. And, and John, he's like, I need to be baptized by you, not you coming to me. In some of the other gospel accounts, he's like, I don't, you're, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandal. John obviously recognizes much of who this guy is and what prophecy he was fulfilling. And in fact, then he's right there at the baptism when the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and God says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He's like the closest one to that event other than Jesus himself. Can you think of anyone on earth besides Jesus who should be more certain about who Jesus is? And yet he sends a message through his disciples to ask, are you the one or should I expect someone else? Right? John is having a crisis of doubt here. Now we don't see that he doubts the Scriptures, but he's thinking, oh, maybe you're not the one. Maybe you're not the Messiah. Maybe I, could just, maybe I was wrong. Maybe there's a mask that needs to be pulled off and you're just a man. And Messiah is still yet to come. Maybe, maybe you have no power over everything. Maybe you have no power beyond the material world. Maybe you're just a man and your ministry is of human invention. Maybe you're just using the Jewish scriptures and things to manipulate people for your own purposes. That, that was not unknown to be going on in this era. Honestly, it's not unknown to be going on today with religion. Maybe he's not the one I thought. Now, this, that could be a real downer but I want us to flip it around and realize how encouraging this is. What do we learn here? We learn we should not be surprised by times of doubt. We shouldn't be surprised about times of doubt, whether we see it in others or our own. I hear this as this should be encouraging. If, if the one person who probably of all humans ever lived should have known who Jesus was can have a moment of crisis of doubt, do I need to freak out when I have one, I, I'm like John. Because we don't want to admit that, do we? Do, do we ever doubt? Have we ever had seasons of doubt? In church, usually you're loath to admit it and afraid of what will happen if you do. This is telling us, listen carefully, this is telling us it's okay. It's not okay, but it's okay. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't want us to get into a concept I've heard some people talking about. Well, it's fine to doubt. In fact, sometimes it's, it's fine to be mad at God or it's fine to doubt about God. It's not fine to be there, but I shouldn't think that it's totally unusual in my Christian walk and experience 
of walking through this life on earth when even Jesus' disciples will, spoiler alert, as we get further in Matthew, like deny and betray him. These things happen. 20 years of ministry. Am I going to stand up here and tell you I've never had seasons of doubt even since I've been a minister? Sure I have. It's okay, but it's not okay. I can, under, I can give myself that it's okay, this happens, but it's not somewhere I want to say it's okay to linger there. What do we see John doing? He's having a crisis of doubt. He takes action. He sends some messengers. I want to explore this. I need to sort this out. I need to get some counsel. I need to hear back. So it's not a, understand, it's not good to doubt. It's not a good place to linger in. But I don't have to jump straight to self-recrimination or even over-exaggeration. Like, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm, I'm not happy. Oh, Christians shouldn't doubt. I, sh- I feel so horrible about myself. I'm, I'm really struggling. Like, I don't need to go down into the dumps. Oh, I had, I'm kind of feeling like I'm doubting. So, am I even a Christian? Like, calm down. John had a moment of doubt here. John the Baptist had doubt day. It doesn't have to be the end of the world, but we should be like John. I, okay, I'm, I'm really struggling today, but I don't want to stay here. Why am I doubting? Who can I talk to? John sends a team to investigate. He sends his mystery-solving teens to talk to Jesus. He sends questions, and he gets an answer. And what is Jesus' answer? He says, all right, check it out, guys. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. People with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor are told good news. Blessed are those who aren't offended by me. We see a heavy emphasis here. Jesus is saying, look and see all the stuff that's happening. And this actually goes back to something we were talking about a few weeks ago with the the miracle chapters. Miracles are supporting reassurance of Christ's primary focus. Again, they're the supporting reassurance of Christ's primary focus. Again, John the Baptist does it. It's not that he wants like our lepers, but he, he doesn't want, those aren't the point. He's like, is Jesus the Messiah and the one who will save us from damnation and reconcile us to our God? And Jesus here offers, as we talked about, the miracles were there to establish his what? Authority. So he's saying, trust I have the authority. Look at my accompanying miracles. Look at the supporting evidence. We explain that as chapter 8 and 9. We see he performs miracles, healings, he, he stops a storm, he does an exorcism. They aren't the point, but they point to his authority. So they aren't meaningless, and they do provide temporary relief for people in real and meaningful ways. But they aren't promised to all believers. We talked about that too. Just because Jesus heals in Scripture doesn't mean he's going to heal everything in this life. He doesn't, he doesn't even get to everybody even in that era, in that time. But the point of them is assurance that he is God incarnate, God with us in the flesh, and that he's in control, that he's who he says he is, and that he'll do all he says he will do. He will accomplish God's good purpose. And it, it seems to me the implication here is probably that John's disciples, and then John received this as a comfort and reassurance. But then it's really interesting because then we see Jesus pivot, don't we? And he starts talking about all these other people who've seen the miracles, and they don't buy it. He proceeds to denounce these towns. They see miracles and yet still don't believe, don't repent, don't turn to the one true Messiah. And so that's, that's where the woes come in here, woe. He's like, if, if these other towns had seen the miracles, they would have been just down on their knees, putting ashes on their heads. He's like, it's going to go poorly for you on the day of judgment. He says, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you're going to go down to Hades. He even brings up Sodom and Gomorrah, a place we always, it's like the worst story in the Bible, right? Oh, they were so bad, fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed. It's like, look at the miracles that I've been doing would have been done in Sodom. They'd still be, they would have repented and been all good today. He's like, it's going to be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. That's harsh, right? If it was a Scooby Doo episode, I'd say rut row. <laughs> it's like, that's Jesus. He's like, if my miracles had been done there, they would have repented. You guys are even more stiff necked, you're even more wicked. And here's the bottom line sinful humans, i.e., us, will always find ways to dismiss 
and to minimize or to rationalize things away. Like we'd like to, I've heard this argument sometimes from people. They're like, well, if God showed up today, if he did a miracle, people captured it on YouTube, of course, so then I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If I saw him show up and stop a storm, of course I'd believe. No. Well, if I saw a miraculous healing or a dead person raised, no. Well, if I saw a demonic possession, a guy floating to the ceiling and boom, I saw it cast it out, I'd believe. No, we would find a way to have doubt and skepticism and write it off and remain in our disbelief. We would unmask it in our minds to our own satisfaction. We'd put a different face on it. In fact, technically, we wouldn't be unmasking it. It's like we're putting the mask on it. No, 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 no. There's, a, there's an earthly explanation for this because we don't want to admit what it really is. Oh, you know what? If everybody who went out and said, storm, stop now, I mean, eventually somebody was going to coincide. It was going to be a coincidence, right? So that must have just been that. And that person who raised from the dead, they were only mostly dead. And really, like, there was a freak meteorological accident, and that, the, the wind just hit, this, hit the Red Sea in the right way that it created this weird water trench. Demon possession, oh, just mental health issues, and uh, the, ritual, the ritual helped them settle it in their own mind. We, we will find a way. Jesus even elaborates then on how, he's like, you've had two radically different messengers, and you wouldn't take it from either of them. Two different p- tones, same message, but, but different delivery systems. That's why he says, he's like, to what shall I compare this generation? You're like kids in the market. It's, like, it's like kids in the marketplaces. And it's like, we played the flute. We played the flute for you. You didn't dance. Sang a lament. You didn't mourn. It's like, you got the joyful message. Repent. The kingdom is near. Yeah. And you're like, meh. And it's like, then you got the dirgy message, right? You guys, you need to repent. The kingdom is near. You're like, well, stop being so emo. Right, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, the guy's a nut job. He has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. They're like, oh, he's just, boy, what a, what a glutton and drunkard. Like, they'll find a way to just write either of them off. I'm going to find a way to dismiss this one. Oh, this one's got the same message coming at me from a different angle. I'll find a way to dismiss this one. John's more the ascetic. He seems more physically or demonstrably other, so out in the wilderness. Jesus is in the world but not of it. And people just find a way to deny and get rid of both. It's like you had Shaggy and Fred from Scooby-Doo, the raggedy guy and the fashionable guy, right? It's like, I don't want to hear it from either of you. We're we're sinful little Goldilocks. Like, oh, your message is too hot. Your message is too cold. I want the one that's just right for me, which is code for tell me what I want to hear. And Jesus is saying, you think the message is too hot? <laughs> Future's going to be a lot hotter, Goldilocks. <laughs> right? That, but Because that's what we do. We find a way to dismiss and minimize or rationalize when sometimes the truth is right in our faces. Jesus is saying, literally, I've done miracles right in front of your face, and yet you will not accept it. We're like Velma Dinkley staring at a ghost. Sorry, I don't have my glasses. But we'll find any excuse because the truth comes with cost. Knowing the truth means, oh, I have to follow it. Acknowledging the truth means I need to repent and be reconciled to God. Things might need to change. I mean, it, we see the same denial even in, in the classic a Christmas carol, right? We see Ebenezer Scrooge do this too in the face of a visiting spirit warning him of his damnation. He's like, you may be an undigested bit of beef or a blot of mustard or a crumb of cheese, an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than grave about you. It's just, it's denial in the face of miraculous reality. And you know, friends, even Christians can Even Christians who love God and believe in God can find themselves sliding into seasons of doubt because we fall into the same minimizing trap. We we minimize or sometimes we just forget or, or let fade the moments where God has shown up in our own lives. And that if there's one takeaway today, very practical application, 
So we should clearly mark the occasions in our lives where God has showed up. Like, do you guys have stories? We can't share them, right? We could share them in community after today or this afternoon, go out to lunch. But do you have stories about God's intercession in your life in dramatic ways, some of you miraculous ways? Let me ask, how do you keep them? How do, how do you actually maintain those? Are they written down? Are they tracked? Have you told them to people who can repeat them back to you in seasons of doubt? It's really easy to say, you know, I'm really questioning. I'm just really not feeling like there's anything beyond this stupid earthly existence today. It's like, oh, wait. No, God has clearly shown, like, sometimes it's like all those things are just turned into a fog in your brain. Have you ever experienced that? I think that sometimes that's spiritual oppression. Shortly after we were married, Catherine and I went through this weird experience in the first, first place we were living together as husband and wife. I'm not sure if it was the place. I'm not sure what it was. But we were also still relatively new at actually walking together as Christians. And she was having these strange experiences and freaking out and seeing something that looked like it was lurking in the periphery. We'd be sitting there alone and she would just, she would freak out. That was first, probably the first and, and only time by God's grace that we really experienced something that did seem like some kind of spiritual torment going on. Actually, and she was afraid. She didn't want to admit it because she didn't want to broach that issue. She's like, God, oh, they'll just think I'm crazy. And a voice kept telling him, to, and something kept telling her, like, don't tell your husband. So she finally told me. It was one of those first times we then as a family started experiencing, well, I'm going to pray over you and pray with you, and we're going to pray together. And it was happening and recurring, and when we actually, when she confessed that reality and we prayed over it together, gone, never, never happened again. Like, that's a reality in my story. And yet, since that event in 19, right around the turn of 1998, 99, since that event, I've still had seasons of doubt. We're just like, oh, is, is there really anything? That, seriously? Jane, you have it in your own story. It's not just the miracles in Scripture. Seen and experienced both the providence of God, the reality of more than this world. Some of you have friends with those stories as well. I knew a friend who was doing missions work and there was a heavy wall that should have collapsed or broken the backs of some people lifting it. It's like they have no explanation except that God helped them move it. And sometimes it's not even miraculous in the normal way we might think. Sometimes you've just seen God show up with an absurd act of charity that came out of left field from someone who didn't even know your problem. Catherine and I were laid off the same week in 2001, we were noticed like out of nowhere, oh, we're closing this office hub. Oh, we need to reduce the staff, both of us. Like then the next week, an elder who shouldn't have known that asked me if I was interested in an internship, the thing that got me into ministry. It was just God's, like, oh, I guess that's just coincidence. No, it's God's providence. So we all have, whether it's a supernatural occurrence, whether it's miraculous provision, some of you have experienced or seen or evidence of healing. Again, these things aren't promised to every Christian or based upon our prayer or our merit, but God does give them as supporting reassurances. And I'm guessing most Christians have them or know a brother or sister who's been blessed by them. I got a whole list of more, but I don't have time to share them today. These things help us deal with our seasons of doubt. In fact, there's recording them or, or making little markers of them. Sometimes God's people would do that to not forget what God had done for them. You know what they called them? Ebenezers. And push back on that Scrooge part, right? And there, there's a primary place where all Christians can rest in assurance that He's real and interceding in our lives. And that's just the simple fact that He's made Himself known to us. Amen? Just the simple fact that we even know Him and believe in Him is by His providence and His will and His good pleasure. And we see that clearly demarcated here in Matthew 11 as well. That salvation is the generous expression of God's will and desire. Jesus says, I praise you. It's like you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. That's humbling, right? There's your takeaway for today. I'm an infant. 
Like, oh, I've been blessed. Is that because James is so much smarter or so much wiser that I recognize the one true God? Oh, no. James, actually, I bypassed the wise people and I, I gave it to the infantile. All right, thank you, Jesus, for the humbling. Why do I believe in Johnny Atheist doesn't? God's good pleasure. God's intercession in my life. Was I smarter? No. Was I wiser? No. Was I more tender-hearted? No. How do I know there's a God and how do I know Jesus is the way to God? Because God desired to reveal him to me. Period. There it is. There's no pride to be had there. I mean, in a weird way, Christians are like the Scooby gang. But it's actually God the one who, God is the one driving the mystery machine. He actually pulls over. He pulls the mask off the lies of the world. He exposes the mistruth. He exposes the falsehood. He exposes the lies the world tells us and Satan tells us. And in fact, our own doubting flesh will tell us. And he tells us, one, I'm the mystery. Two, I'm the solution to the mystery. Three, I'm the solver of the mystery. We're about as effective as Shaggy and Scooby. We might be used a bit in his plan, but we're mostly just along for the ride and sometimes look foolish. That, that's, that's not a shameful thing. That's actually quite an honor. It's quite an honor to be brought into the family of God and be used by him. I mean, we see here in this passage, Jesus lift up John the Baptist. He says John had, it, John had an honor unmatched by all before him. Some people really ponder and meditate what that's about. Right? It says, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. That's not nothing. Think about all the people in both biblical or history that would have preceded John the Baptist 2,000 years ago. Probably most of us kind of think some people are bigger, more monumental. And then what do you do with this? What does this mean? Because we just saw him doubting. It's not a testimony to his character per se. It's a recognition of his honor and his office. He was chosen to be the herald of the Messiah of mankind. There's no greater honor, amen? No greater, no greater privilege. The greatest privilege of anyone up in human history up until Jesus. He's also fulfilling prophecy from Malachi and Isaiah. So Jesus likens him to Elijah. Although in the Gospel of John, John himself makes it clear he's not literally Elijah. It's not reincarnation or anything like that. He's fulfilling a prophetic type. Malachi 3.1 says, See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he'll clear the way before me. And the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he's coming, says the Lord. John the Baptist is the forerunner who points the way to the arrival of the Lord, just, just like Elijah did a very similar thing in, in a lesser way in the Old Testament. And, and may again in the future read Revelation 11 and have lots of rabbit trail conversations later. But then Jesus says something very curious because he says, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What's that about? The least in the greatest of heaven. Well, I, I was just called an infant. Does that mean me? We can actually kind of check out, Leon Morris put it in a, a wonderful way that I grabbed and I uh, wanted to share this morning because he, he articulated it pretty succinctly. And this is something, like, Christians have gone round and round, what, what is he saying here? A very simple summation that's pretty helpful to me this week. He says, if it's surprising that John was the greatest man who ever lived, it's even more surprising that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is not denigrating John but bringing out the wonder of being included in the kingdom. Great though he was, John the Baptist belonged to the previous order. He proclaimed the need for repentance in view of the coming of the Messiah, but his function was preliminary to the Christian era. He was not in that era and therefore in some sense of a lesser stature than those who are in it. John is classed among those who preceded the kingdom. Jesus is speaking of unimportant people who are in the kingdom of heaven, and it is the measure of the greatness of the privilege of being in the kingdom, he proclaimed, that its humblest member surpasses the greatest of the human race thus far. Amen? That's the joy. I don't get to say, I ever, you know, hey, at least I'm greater than John the Baptist. No, I don't get to say, ha, I'm great. I get to humbly say, 
God has bestowed on me that level of greatness and honor and blessing? I should take that seriously. I should take that soberly. I should, I should receive that honor and say I need to act honorably. I need to walk and act and live and breathe like an ambassador of the kingdom. And, and I don't need to doubt. I can rest in Him. That's why He says, it, it, we, we finish there, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Take up my yoke. Learn from me. I'm lowly and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right? Are any of you plagued by doubt? But come to Jesus. Disbelief honestly takes a lot of effort. I believe Romans 1 with all my heart. It says when we have disbelief or, or if we're plagued or, or sort of sucked into that or, or pulled into that with a, with a season or a day of doubt, what we're actually trying to do is the enemy's trying to get us to suppress the truth. That actually takes effort. When God says simply to look at a beautiful sunrise and the one cloud, uncloudy day a year when we see Mount Rainier, he says that this testifies to my reality. Two days, sorry, Mark. I believe that. Disbelief actually takes effort. And why do we disbelieve? Because we don't, we don't want our hearts to fully align with His Word. Our desires are errant. There's something we don't want to let go of something that seems to satisfy us but, but actually is unhealthy for us and reflects poorly on His kingdom. And why do we doubt? Sometimes because the enemy discourages us, but also sometimes because doubt allows us to be in tension and kind of hold something back, not give ourselves wholly and fully to God's will and God's Word. And again, I think that takes effort to remain caught up in that tension. And, and Jesus is saying, let it go. Just come to me. Put it down. And if, if we don't feel that call, if we don't feel that tug, then honestly, that should be our prayer, friends. Our prayer should be that God will burden our hearts to find rest in Jesus. Sometimes we need our hearts burdened when we're lingering or attaching, when we're not finding rest in Jesus. We should feel that burden. It's like the only place I can go to unpack that burden, to let it go, is actually to just give myself to Jesus. We're told the desire to come to Him comes from Him. It's like, Jesus, put that desire in my heart. May it be your desire that I could come to you like a child and you could give me rest and unburden me. Our prayer should be, Jesus, let your desire be to show me the way. Show me the Father. Show me truth. Show me life. Should be Jesus, may it be your pleasure that I can follow you. No doubt, no distractions, no falling into disbelief. May I just rest in your reality. We don't want to be like Tyre and Sidon. We don't want to be like Capernaum. We don't want to dismiss or deny Jesus. They say, Jesus, help us to repent Humble us. Help me to my knees. Put my hands together. Right? Unmask the, the mystery of my disbelief because it's, it's probably me. It's probably something in me, something in my heart. We need to pray, God, just, just unmask that. We're so often our own worst enemy. We're fooling ourselves instead of finding rest in you, God. So my hope for us today as we come to the table, as we come to communion, is, is we can confess those things freely to God and just confess doubt, confess our struggles, confess our sins. And just say, God, I want to put those things down. And I want to rest in you. Help me to come to your table with, with a heart that is unburdened and just ready to receive you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ways you show up, the ways you reinforce our faith, the, re you, the way you bolstered John's faith in a season of doubt. May all, everyone here be fortified and bolstered in their season. May they, leave, may they leave today with the confidence that I believe John's disciples had to go back and reassure their friend and brother. He's the one. Jesus, you're the one. 
God, may all leave here today recognizing what you did as we remember Christ in communion, as we remember his body broken on the cross, paying the price for sin for all who put their trust in him. His blood shed, atoning again, paying the price of, of what we deserve, and instead we get your unmerited favor in relationship with you. Help us to rest in that, to better understand that, to look to our lives and both our story as, as Scripture is our story if we are in your kingdom, but also to our personal story, that we would also log and create little Ebenezer's with our, with our family, with our household, with our church, to remember where you've shown up. So that if there is a day we struggle, if there's a day where things seem barren, if things seem empty or hollow or meaningless or strictly earthly, we know we can be reassured that there is a kingdom far beyond this one, far better than this one. Because of Jesus, it's already here, and you're establishing it. We're a part of it, and we'll know it fully and for eternity in Jesus' name. Amen.